common neighborhood association, um, Michael Coleman. We have a, a pretty good uh, number of people and members here this evening. We're happy to see that. You know, originally we were going to be upstairs, but there's construction going on in the uh, hotel. That's how we ended up down here. So this evening, uh, we're going to have a speaker. We'll do that first, like we always do. The um, Originally, we had uh, you probably received the flyer that said that uh, Bob Monk, the facilities manager, was going to be here this evening, but because of an unforeseen emergency, he's out of town. So Jay Finney, the uh, chief marketing officer of the PEM, has graciously <laughs> agreed to step in for him. You may know Jay. He's been with the museum probably more than 10 years, and you, if you've been at an event at the museum, you've seen him, or if you've been at Armory Park, every time we have the uh, muster, when it begins at Armory Park, Jay is always there that welcomes people. So uh, Jay is going to tell us a little bit about the act uh, activities that's going on at the museum in regards to the Bray House and also uh, the expansion of the museum. If people would like to that also. So, Jay, would you like to have Great. Come Sure. Without the acoustics and microphone and this podium, I'm going to stand out in front of it as well. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting the uh, inviting museum here to, to give you an update on uh, some of the projects we've got going. And uh, I've always heard that this group is a very active group and passionate about the environment and uh, the immediate environment and uh, I can see by the turnout that you, you guys really are participating participants and very very much care for the surrounding area and it is a beautiful beautiful comet so uh, if I wasn't living where I am I'd be living where you are <laughs> but at any rate um, yeah, I was asked to speak about the Bray House um, and does everybody know what the Bray House is and where it is okay not everybody does the Bray House is um, right over here on this, uh, what's the street that, that Brown, goes down? Brown, Brown, Brown Street. Brown, Brown, Brown. And um, I think just one house in, or right out, uh, after the brick wall, there's a house that is gray, low set, maybe I think two stories high. It has recently had a big scarlet, you know, letter on the front uh, from the fire department, meaning that if there's a fire in that building, they are not to enter because it's not habitable and therefore they don't want to risk uh, any lives trying to save it or save people inside because there would be no people inside. But it certainly was something that we wanted to take care of. Um, and so it was a building that was built um, in the early 1800s and then modernized uh, a variety of times almost to an unrecognizable state in terms of its historic uh, configuration. And we started working, um, we had stabilized the building some time before, but um, we wanted to put a lot more work into it more recently, and certainly the you know getting that mark from the uh, <coughs> from the fire department made us redouble our efforts and put some funds into it right uh, right now. We spent about six hundred thousand dollars a year just on stewardship of the of the various houses, historic houses that are on our campus, um, including the ones that are open for public uh, tours as well as the, the houses that are used for office space or other things. At any rate, there's been a lot of work done over the last year. Um, to with a few goals in mind. First of all, to stabilize the house. Uh, next, to um, remove all the modern furnishings and finishes so that we could get at the earlier configurations of the house and to see how far back we can actually um, see the house configuration and the, the original woodwork. We've actually been very successful taking the house back to, uh, I think, 1806. Um, and, and seeing how the house looked then um, and being able to uh, get at that part of the house after removing the modern finishes. Um, over the coming months, as the weather is continuing to get nicer, um, we, you'll see some more activity um, with new windows being put in and work on the roof. Um, this coming year, as more and more of that takes place, we'll be doing a comprehensive study on the Bray House and determining uh, to what point we want to take the house back or interpret the house. As you might have seen from the uh, Chinese house, the Yin Yi Yi Yung Tong house uh, on our campus, um, they decided to take the house, but actually to interpret the house at the moment we acquired the house. So some rooms are old, some rooms are newer, etc. And it was a, a really interesting choice. A lot of times houses are taken back to some earlier time. We've been able to take the, uh, figure out what the configuration is, as I said, back to 1806. And so what stage in its, um, in its various modifications do we want to interpret the house? 
It's doubtful um, that we will be doing, that we'll have the house open for public tours, like we do the Gardner Pingree House and the Crown and Shield Bentley House. Uh, a number of our ho houses on our historic property on our campus um, are um, used for office space or you know, classrooms or other things. And so we'll be also looking at options for adaptive reuse for that house as well. Um, but we were able to uh, strip away the, the modernization over the time and see the historic components. We actually didn't expect to be able to get back to uh, a, a date anywhere near as early as that uh, because of so much modernization. We didn't really think it still had the bones uh, of the house that we could get at. Um, but that proved when we started investigating not to be the case. So we're delighted at that. Um, in addition, um, the, uh, you might have read about, you know, in general with the expansion and the uh, renovation of the Phillips Library, um, we also received a major gift to an endowment for all the historic houses. Some of the historic houses had endowments, uh, some didn't. Of course, the ones that had the endowments were in the best shape, and the ones that didn't really needed those endowments. Um, so uh, this is an endowment fund for all the historic houses, so we can uh, apply the funds to the areas that are most needed. Obviously, the Bray House uh, was one of our, our key priorities, and so we will be able to make all the improvements we, we ever would want to for that house. The Ropes Mansion is going apace as well. We don't have an, uh, a reopening date for that, but it will be in its best shape it's ever been um, with new wiring and other things that uh, we would probably not do if we hadn't had the opportunity, not that you ever want a fire to go into your house and, and give you that opportunity. But um, we're very, very pleased with the restoration work that is going on there. Um, also next year, um, and be part and parcel of deciding how to interpret the Bray House, will be a comprehensive um, uh, and an ongoing study of all the houses and where we, what, we, what our interpretive plans are. Uh, different kinds of tours, different kinds of restoration, um, how we can best utilize all the houses and integrate the houses into the overall plan with the upcoming expansion of the museum facility. So that's um, the update on the Bray House, uh, as far as uh, as far as I know, and having just talked to to Bob Monk about it. Are there questions about the Bray House? We have to get its name. Uh, that's the one question I don't know, <laughs> oh, but I will get back to you on that. Uh, it might have Sorry. been one of the families who had documented his own. It I believe it was a retail uh, at some point too. There was a shop down below, and uh, some of you've been in the neighborhood. Yes. Uh, will it be restored with plumbing uh, facilities, like toilet facilities, mm -hmm. or it would depend on the. Or, or is it going to be authentic? It would depend. Uh, I I would think that if we're going to have people in there, for instance, an adaptive reuse plan uh, indicated that it was best used, say, as office space, um, then we would probably have modern plumbing as part of that. If it was taken back to some earlier time and been authentic, um, you probably wouldn't have that in there. But the house does not have enough there that we think that, like you see the Crown and Shield Bentley House or the Ward House, right. where you really could show off something of a period. But in terms of preservation and stabilization of an historic house, we will reach that. But how we're going to use it is, uh, I think, next question. Any other questions? Do you have any questions about the expansion? Go ahead. Where's most of it going to be? Near the Charter Street uh, Cemetery, at that part of the building? Um, the, uh, the buildings that if you are in the museum and you go to the, if you come in down the spine of the, the entrance and you turn right and you see the big atrium open in front of you, down at the other end is a, 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 a door or a portal that goes into the galleries there. Mm -hmm. Korea, China, or Japan, China, etc., etc. All those galleries and all those buildings, um, which are clued together in more modern times and, and not provided a very good space or environmentally secure space for the installation of art, they are all going to be coming down. There's no historic component to that. East Indian Marine Hall, I have to emphasize, is being pristine and not going to change. It's a national historic landmark and of great importance. And in fact, what we're going to be doing is exposing the south side of that facade 
in another atrium that you'll be able to see from the softy atrium. You'll be able to look right through where those those sort of balcony things are, and you'll see light there, open uh, with glass, and you'll have uh, now that whole side. Right now, they built whatever building they did. They built it right up against the south facade of East Marine Hall with those big uh, stone dogs that food dogs right. are. We'll be moving the food dogs, taking that building down, exposing that, and that will be the facade you'll see in a second and smaller atrium space, which will be beautiful. We'll be uh, going down and building um, uh, basements for conservation and art handling right now. This is something we really couldn't fix the last time, but right now um, the, the Artwork comes in for a special exhibition way down there, but it has to be handled and prepped way down there, and conservation is way over there. So nothing downstairs is really where it should be, and we'll be fixing all of that when we build the, the basements down there, and then arts, also some air handling. We're going to be taking down the power plant building, which is this square brick building on Charter Street, and taking the mechanicals from that and putting them on top of the Dodge Wing, which is the big concrete, you know, faceless right back to the right of the entrance mm -hmm. of the museum. And those will have the new, new mechanicals, uh, and the noise-making air handling will be down, um, down below ground, um, and that will fuel the, and run the, the rest of the museum, the current and also the expanded. Yes? Um, the, the big black wall you're talking about to the right of the, of the skip shop and everything, yeah. What's going to be done to that big black wall? Well, it is, you know, I'd love to do stuff to it, but uh, every time I think about putting up banners or, <coughs> or any kind of graphics or visuals or anything, the wind just takes it right off. Um, that was one of the so first no things I did. For a change with some windows or anything no, like well, I'd that. love that. But, uh, you know, that's the architects of the early 70s. They just lost their minds. It's called brutalist architecture, and you can see that. I mean, that's the term for it, so you can see why. Not my favorite part of the building. Yes? What's the timeline on all? The uh, construction um, will start, uh, well, the first thing that will happen is that Dodge Wing that has the American Oceanic, Indian, Indian Art, etc. That uh, will close in July of this year so they can build new mechanicals on top of that, that building. Just that floor, just uh, there's the Art and Nature Center, the Family Center, and above. That will close for nine months until next May where they'll be putting the mechanicals on that. Then as soon as that reopens, the part that I described to you, all the sort of rabbit warren kind of space, that closes. In the meantime, we'll be getting ready to move all that art out and into storage to prepare the building to be demolished. The, the demo work will start probably around um, July of 2013. Um, and then we hope to open, uh, have opening events uh, at the tail end of 2016 probably a public opening in the first quarter of 2017. Yes? Where is all this money coming from? Can't tell you. Can't tell you. <laughs> Wish I knew. No, I mean, there's, there's a core group of extremely generous donors. Um, certainly there have been long-time donors that I've been, you know, that are somewhat known out there. Um, but we have a lot of people who have, have um, really stretched to put together this kind of funding. And, and how is attendance these days? This past year is the best year we've ever had. Um, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, just one more quick question. Um, there's a lot of talk about letting traffic go on the walking mall certain parts of the year, not mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. What are your comments or feelings about the plan to let traffic go on the walking mall? Oh, well, this is somewhat of a loaded question. I suppose we paid for um, the facilitation of a number of public meetings. Some of you uh, might have been there to talk about the various options. We're now working with the city to seek grant funds to take the design step a bit further. Um, certainly the goals that everybody has um, about revitalization of that area, better uh, nice restaurants and people out on the, you know, on tables on the street, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The key to that is visibility. If you don't have the visibility, the the restaurants and others wouldn't be down there because no one would know they are there, no matter how much advertising you do. The most successful um, pedestrian malls are ones that are mixed use. Certain times there's traffic. It's not about parking next to the restaurant. It's about people going by the restaurant and retail and seeing it and knowing that it's there. So I, I think that it would be actually a good thing to have mixed use certain times, certain hours, 
where there are where there are, are cars and when there aren't and when there's just pedestrians and when there's not cobblestones that you know some people have trouble walking over um, and, and the fountain area um, right in our front door you know we, we're working with the city to see if we can come up with plans to you know improve that area so I'm hoping that our interest and in, you know our our interest as a museum and having that kind of traffic flow matches what the city overall feels is the right way to to revitalize downtown and uh, create the kind of environment along uh, Essex Street that we'd like. But I know there are mixed feelings, you know, all around. I'm sorry, yes? Any uh, update on the uh, uh, ability to utilize the uh, Phillips Library? Uh, uh, I called uh, a few days ago uh, uh, because I need something for the uh, Historical Commission mm -hmm. and was told that they're in the process of moving things, and mm -hmm. but it might actually be two years before you, I could actually uh, get anything from the library. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what, what, what's the big hold up? Well, if we're moving the entire collection out and storing it somewhere else, first of all, you have a, a huge amount of uh, <coughs> objects to identify, barcode, um, and uh, catalog. Is what we're going to be doing end of this project, the library project, is uh, a, a digital catalog of everything that we have. We have a pretty good idea of all the things we have, but a lot of them don't have a little card, and many of them aren't digitized, the cards, so you can't even tell what we have. So in order to tell what we have, we have to actually go through it all. So the huge process, you know, they've got these barcoder things, and they're, they're going through the massive an, a number of, uh, of objects that we have. That takes a while. So there's not going to be access to the collection for scholars while we are cataloging and uh, identifying what's there. Then we have to move all of that, and we have to do it in a sequential way so that it goes where we, we want it to go, and we know everything that was here is there. Then we have to develop an uh, accessibility <coughs> in the other location in order to be able to provide, and the, the goal is to still provide some um, accessibility to scholars such as yourself to the collections. But it is a very complicated um, process that you really can't hurry. The goal of the staff is to make it accessible in a limited way as soon as possible. So the, 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 the figure two years, uh, it may be less than that, but the goal, I mean the, the end result is you know a ten million dollar renovation and retrofitting of the library to bring it up to the highest standards, um, a renovation and restoration of the entire interior of the building, a cataloging of, of, of an enormously large collection, and then a reinstallation of all that uh, that collection back in the library. Does that mean digitizing everything? That's no, it doesn't. There's a difference between digitizing the catalog, so you know what we <coughs> have, and digitizing the objects. That would be multi-million dollars more, it would take years and years to actually digitize the collection. Now I imagine that over the course of time, as we identify certain collections, that, that uh, there are a number of grant orga granting organizations that would say, I'll pay for the digitization of that, like the witch papers are digitized. Um, and a number of other sub-collections are digitized, but that's an enormous long-term project. First you've got to know what you have. And you need to provide that access worldwide so that scholars know you have X, Y, and Z. They'll come and they'll see it, but the goal of digitizing the collection is not something that uh, we can consider at this point. Yes. Uh, I understand you have some wonderful artifacts stored in the basement that haven't been seen in years. <coughs> Are there plans to bring that up and exhibit it? Well, with 1.8 million objects, Assuming you, can do you know, there's, there's uh, no way. We have the fourth largest collection of art and culture of any museum in, in North America. Um, the Chicago is, I forget what the, the top three in art museums. So most museums only show a fraction of their collection anyway. Our fraction is even smaller because our collection is huge. We'll, we'll, we will be taking this opportunity to go and tell me when I'm, when you oh, okay. <laughs> All right. We will be taking the opportunity to re-examine the collection and collection areas. For instance, the African American collection came down, and we want to get that back up again. There's a certain class of objects, certain areas of the of the world, certain types of things. There's not a lot of some of the scrimshaw. There were all kinds of prioritizations that went on and choices that went on when we reinstalled in 2002. We're going to be reinstalling every inch of every gallery, even the ones that are in the, the softy wing. 
we'll be reinstalling those and adding 75,000 square feet of additional gallery space. We will be the ninth largest art museum in the country, in actually North America. So we'll have plenty more space, but it won't be 1.8 million worth of space. And so, and you know, we have a lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want to bring. <coughs> it's not really useful for display, but for for scholarship. So, um, 75,000 square feet is larger than most museums, and that's just the additional space to the 100,000 we have now. So it is uh, a huge project um, and very exciting, and we're going to be moving along really, really quickly. Yes. Yes, uh, Jay. That there is one artifact that, uh, if I could just put a little plug in for it to come back. Everybody has one. That's I know. Sure. <laughs> well, this one is kind of an interest for me. Um, in your collection, and I've been talking with Dan Penamore, you have um, Kaiser Wilhelm's steering wheel from his yacht, <laughs> and it's very, very interesting because that was the yacht that he had romanced uh, Zahn Nicholas, mm -hmm. and they had signed an agreement. And it could have changed the whole world politics if that agreement actually went in because it, the, the Kaiser will declare war against Russia. Mm -hmm. and, and that wheel um, was handled by both of them. And it could have changed all of world politics. And I've been oh teasing Dan Fenimore to get that back up and do an exhibit mm -hmm. on how an artifact could represent a whole world's change. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Now that I know about it, I'll bug him. <laughs> I'm, I'm close to Dan, and I love that area of our, of our no, collection, too. So. It's phenomenal. And, and the Tsar was so naive, and the it fell under the, under the spell of the German yeah. emperor. It was almost done. Mm -hmm. so. Very cool. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes. We can also say a word for the stuffed buffalo. <laughs> that, I'm telling you right now, no way. That <laughs> buffalo is not coming that, back. The turtle, the turtle is not coming back. I used to like the doll houses. The doll houses. And your doll houses, um, they were in the Essex Institute. I used to bring my kids there in the 70s, in the early 70s. Yeah. There were these wonderful doll houses. I, uh, you know, the, there's, and keep those cards and letters coming in. Because, uh, <laughs> there, we just finished a retreat. We went out um, on a three-day retreat with the senior staff to kind of vision, just this last weekend, vision what a new museum, what our new museum could be. Um, what would define a, a museum of the 21st century if you had the wherewithal, as we seem to, to really rethink what an art museum can be, what kind of objects you can have out, how you can mix cultures and work with themes, and a gallery about love and what objects might connote that, and as, in addition to maritime art and Japanese art, etc., but you can mix um, collections and talk about themes and explore all kinds of things if you were willing to take those kinds of risks. So we had a really, really great uh, weekend, and one of the things we decided is to uh, no collection area is off limits. But the buffalo, <laughs> <laughs> not happening. Why is the may, buffalo maybe the, you know, huh? Why is the buffalo off limits? Well, the buffalo is a is a very very old old artifact. We changed the type of museum we we ought, we were from a very eclectic but not very coherent collection of you know cool stuff. Everybody has their favorite. You know the buffalo, the shrunken heads, the the, the turtle, um, to a museum of art and culture. And although we still have a natural history component, which is in the Art and Nature Center, basically using art, basically using nature to convey or to, um, to illustrate how artists are inspired by natural forms to create art, not only in the Art and Nature, the Family Interactive Center, but elsewhere in the museum. And so if we were still a natural history museum for its own sake, we would probably be bringing out a number of those old hits but it's no longer consistent with the museum that we've become and evolved to. Some people like that evolution. Some people wish we were the, 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 you know, kept with the older museum. By and large, we've been pretty successful where we've, we've gone, but uh, the, the buffalo, and I've seen the buffalo. It's, it's not in good shape, really. <laughs> is there one more question for Ron? Uh, I'm happy to, uh, well, on your time, I'm happy to get it. Um, yeah, yeah, well, the question I'd really like to know is, when I moved up to Salem 20 years ago, you had the papers from the trials yeah. on display. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans down the road to have the, the papers on display to the public? Yeah. yeah, that's what I've been actually advocating ever since I got there. Um, because I think they're really, really interesting and they have a lot to teach us. The crowds that come in October 
mainly are not are, are, are not as interested in witch history as they are in witches. And so there's a big yeah. difference. Um, there's a year-round interest, I think, in the cultural ramifications uh, uh, and legal ramifications of the, the witch trials. Um, and so, again, no collection area is off limits. And also there's a much stronger, going to be a much stronger integration of materials from the library into the collection areas of the museum. So you'll see objects, you'll see manuscripts in the same gallery as paintings and sculpture, etc. We'll be utilizing them, whatever works to convey a, a particular point or worldview. There'll also be probably more uh, attention paid to, uh, to local history in addition to global history. I'm a living history enthusiast, hands-on history. Uh -huh. Do you have any plans of opening up a room or a facility where people can actually try hands-on history? Well, again, we're, we're not a history museum, as we define ourselves. We're a museum of art and culture. So culture can stand for history. Um, it can stand for objects from everyday life. Um, we're talking about creativity is all around us and everything that, that, that uh, we, we touch and come in contact with. But as a, a pure hands-on history with, say, demonstrators or people in costumes, not the kind of museum that we are. Um, I can say that we, do, we are exploring ways that you can actually, you know, one of the things you can't do in art museums, you can't touch something. Why does it have to be that way? Um, can you get closer than having to be behind a glass wall several feet or an object set back five feet from, from the, uh, the velvet rope? So we certainly want to have people get closer to objects, but in terms of hands-on history teaching like a Pioneer Village or, or a Stockbridge or a What's the one? Williamsburg. Uh, Williamsburg. Uh, we won't be, probably not be doing that. Okay, well, you know, I think... All right, well, I'm, I'm happy to come back. Time. Um, and um, and uh, thanks a lot again for, for having me here, and I hope I've answered some of the bigger questions. We will be um, uh, making every effort to be as transparent and to be as forthcoming, uh, to give you advance notice of anything that's going to be happening in terms of construction, to tell you what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, and we're going to be making a, a major effort so that everyone feels that they are informed. Some people will agree with some things or not, but we hope it won't be a mystery as to why we're doing it and what the, the cost benefits are and what the, uh, the benefits to the, the disabled community are. And hopefully everyone will see it as a good thing. Um, we're in a different situation now than we were in 2003 where you, you know, didn't have the museum in this kind of scale. And it was a questionable, it wasn't necessarily a given that it would be the thing that it has become. But uh, hopefully, uh, we all feel that it is a good thing and it will be more of a good thing. <laughs> so, that's what we hope. All right. Thank you very much.